Well, hello and welcome, everyone. For thank you for joining us uh, here in person, online for the live stream, and if you're watching the the recording, thank you so much for taking the time to join us for the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire's third foreign policy on the ballot conversation with candidates uh, for the U.S. president as we're moving towards the New Hampshire primary. Um, signing day is is currently ongoing, um, so we're starting to see more and more great conversations around the world, uh, around global issues, and we're so happy today to have Chase Oliver, a Libertarian candidate for president, with us today. Uh, have a few things to get through before we get into the conversation, uh, but thank you, Chase, for, for joining us and, and being willing to talk about uh, some global issues and, and sort of outlining your positions. Um, the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, and therefore we do not take any stances on policies, parties, politics, uh, or candidates. We provide all of these events as an opportunity for people to learn, be informed, and engage uh, specifically for these with, with candidates uh, so that you can make it a more informed decision when you go to the, the ballot box uh, whenever that ends up happening here in New Hampshire, because uh, I know we haven't officially set a date yet. But also the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire is a membership community supported organization. So we thank all of our wonderful members, donors, supporters, and sponsors for the ongoing support that they give us to allow us to bring these conversations uh, to the, the, audience, the public audience that we, we have both here in New Hampshire, centered here in New Hampshire, but as well as around the country and around the state, um, around the, the world. Um, so, uh, with that out of the way, uh, I'll, I'll keep Chase's introduction short so that we can have a, as much of a conversation as possible, but uh, Chase has uh, been a libertarian activist for, for many years. He has run uh, in his home state of Georgia for both the House and Senate on the, the federal level and uh, helped to push the uh, Herschel walker Raphael warnock uh, uh, race to, uh, to a second round. Uh, really pushing candidates on, on some of their ideas and, um, uh, and their, the issues of the day. Um, so Chase has been uh, on, a, on a New England trip here, hitting five of the six states, uh, mm -hmm. headed back home and here, here in, a, in a little bit, but uh, it seems like this is one of your first trips to New Hampshire, so what, what has your sense been so far? Yeah, so uh, it's my second time second. Uh, to New Hampshire, but uh, you know, it's been a really great time. First time was kind of out to Fort Best, and I was out in kind of the rural area of New Hampshire, so this is my first time seeing the more you know, urbanized side of New Hampshire, and it's been a great trip. Uh, and I've really enjoyed getting to connect with lots of voters. And uh, New Hampshire, much like other early primary states, uh, voters are not afraid to walk right up to you and ask you a question. And uh, that's one of the great things about New Hampshire is you get that retail politics when you're running for president. So it's been a pleasure. Good. Well, we're, we're excited to ask some questions and have questions from our, our audiences uh, as well. But I'll start off with just a couple because that's my, my prerogative here. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. We, uh, of course, are talking about foreign policy and, that, and national security, and that can, can entail a lot of things. But I'd just like to give you an opportunity to start off and, and talk a little bit about what uh, your ideas on foreign policy are and what a Oliver administration would look to do in sort of the United States' role in the world. Yeah, so uh, first, I think it's important to know kind of where my philosophy kind of comes from, like where, and I believe, you know, I'm the generation of the war on terror generation. I was in high school when 9-11 occurred, and war in Iraq, uh, and other wars in you know, Afghanistan, and others started shortly after 9-11. And so I believe my foreign policy has been informed by being a part of that generation. Uh, many of the other candidates for president, our president who currently inhabits the White House, their foreign policy has been informed through the Cold War. That was the major national security movement they were kind of living and being a part of. And I feel like it's actually time for us to really start moving past the Cold War mindset this is one of the reasons why I'm running as somebody who's under 40 who wants to be representing the United States as president is because I think our politics need to be in a 21st century foreign policy, not kind of stuck in the 20th century where we're doing things. That being said, I got started being an anti-war activist. Uh, I had friends who got sent over to Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, they came back with injuries, both uh, physical and uh, mental health injuries uh, that they had to overcome. And so I became an anti-war activist. The first time I was tear gassed by the United States government was out there protesting the war in Iraq. 
And so really my worldview is one where I want to see us taking a step back militarily. I want to remove our military footprint because I see for the last 20 some odd years, uh, wherever we have placed ourselves militarily, uh, we have not created so much peace and stability, so much as instability and, and the great unknown about what's going to be happening in the future, whether you look at uh, the way Afghanistan, we fought for 20 years to remove the Taliban, we gave it back to them. Uh, uh, Iraq is, is majorly unstable. We had millions of refugees, uh, half a million Iraqis dead, I believe is the number, and of course thousands of service members. And so I want to see us base our foreign policy more in free trade and more in market relationships with other nations as opposed to trying to impose our foreign policy at the barrel of a gun or using a drone bomb. Uh, I think ultimately that will create more peace and goodwill in the region, uh, you know, in, in all the world rather, uh, but it will create more peace and goodwill with the United States throughout different regions of the world where we might not have such goodwill today. And just to follow up on that, uh, when you say lessen our military footprint, uh, is that simply not using our military as in the ways that we have in the past or uh, pulling back on bases and, and military stations abroad? It's certainly more the latter. Uh, I think ultimately, you know, again, this is about removing ourselves from the Cold War mindset. You know, we've had bases all over the world for the purposes of containing communism, containing the USSR, and really it's time for us to stop thinking in this necessary mindset and removing ourselves from being that, like, have to have that giant footprint in every continent. I say often, uh, I would like to ultimately, ideally, see the United States military footprint being placed solely in North America to protect ourselves from invasion. Uh, I recognize that in four or even eight years, you wouldn't be able to untangle every single uh, alliance that you have there or the ability to have bases, but I think we need to start that process. Uh, the reason being is that the constant expansive of militarism has not really been shown to like, ultimately be in the best interest of the United States abroad. It does not create uh, goodwill in many areas of the world. And so I would like to see us try a different trend. And there will be proof of concept of that. As we pull back, if we see you know, great changes, we see approval of the morale of people's opinion in the United States, we can say this is a good choice to take. We have always been on the other side of things, expanding. We need to now see what restricting militarism looks like. And I think that's uh, the path I want to take because I'm ultimately, you know, I'm darn near a pacifist when it comes to these things. Yeah. Um, you mentioned alliances. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit about how those play into your thinking when thinking about engagement with the world? Are they are they a net positive, a net drain, or somewhere in between? You know, uh, ultimately, you know, some some have shown to be you know good, some have shown to be not beneficial. Ultimately, I think if you look at it like on a total scale, I don't think entangling ourselves in alliances has been a good thing because what it does is it requires the United States to have to back uh, actions around the world, uh, but sometimes people that we might not even necessarily agree with at the time, but due to having to be entangled in those alliances, where kind of our hand is pushed, and I think we're seeing that in uh, you know we're seeing that in different theaters around the world now, uh, but that's something that I would like to reduce is like. I think the only time the United States should be really acting militarily around the world, which is not the entirety of foreign policy, should be when the United States declares war. I think we really need to refocus our foreign policy on how we can develop market relationships with other nations, improve our trade with other nations, break down trade barriers, so that way we interconnect our economies. Because the truth is, is when you're trading with somebody, you're less likely to want to shoot them because they're either your customer or they're your, uh, or they're your producer. So it's like, you want to make sure that that relationship continues. This is also why I think, and this is kind of skipping forward a little bit, why I think the rhetoric around China from both China and the United States government is a bit of saber rattling. China wants to saber rattle because they want to appear large on the world stage. They want to appear that they can challenge the United States militarily, and they're puffing their chest out. And of course, the United States, they have the vested interest due to the military industrial complex to puff our chest out and say, well, we need all these weapon systems, and we need all this Pentagon spending to fight back China. The truth is, is our economies are so interconnected that if we were to go to war with each other, it would be mutually assured economic destruction. And I don't think the leaders in China, nor our leaders in the United States are very serious about that. I think a lot of that is to uh, placate their kind of bases and, and supporters at home domestically. So of course we want to get to the, the China issue because it is probably one of, if not the largest, uh, global geopolitical challenge of the day. Uh, but I think uh, just sort of where the conversation has been headed, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Uh, you, you talk about economic entanglements uh, or, or economic relations being a, a pathway towards peace, but of course we've seen Russia uh, attack Ukraine and the sanctions that have come out of that. There's a lot of questions around the world as to whether or not 
that path is, is viable anymore. Um, Russia has taken a massive hit to their, their economy. Europe has taken a massive hit to their economy. Inflation has been rampant around the world in part because of uh, what's been going on in Russia, Ukraine. How does that factor into your, your thinking? Is think that a one-off thing or something that is a broader trend? Well, I think it's a trend that we can look at is like, do economic sanctions really stop the bad actors from doing bad things? I think in this case it hasn't. Vladimir Putin still moved across the border. He still invaded Ukraine, even though there was great uh, economic shock to his people. And the truth is, is Vladimir Putin's just doing just fine. He's going to be eating just fine tonight. But many of his people are not due to these economic sanctions. And as you mentioned, there's also the added effect of now our allies in Europe are suffering from our sanctions as well, particularly in the energy sector, because Russia is not very happy to be trading with people who are sanctioning them. And so it's creating an energy crisis in Europe. And so we need to be thinking about, does that really stop them? I don't think it does. And so uh, also sanctions also hurt the most innocent people. Like when we sanction Cuba, uh, it doesn't really affect the military leaders of Cuba so much. It does affect the average person who can't get the goods they need to live, or the bread, or the meat that they need to live. And so when we're examining our foreign policy, I, I don't think that sanctions are necessarily the ultimate, like they're not a silver bullet, certainly. And uh, it's something that you would really need to examine whether they're actually going to work at all in most cases. Uh, and you know, I think it's important to recognize that, yeah, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. It's a terrible thing. I don't think sanctions would have prevented him. I don't think a lack of sanctions would have you know, lessened that either. I, I don't think he was spurned on by the sanctions. I think he was already intending to do what he was going to do. Um, within that, uh, of course, we, we almost saw a U.S. government shutdown, uh, as well as Speaker McCarthy losing his speakership, pretty much because of the, uh, the question of Ukraine support. Uh, there's a lot of questions as to whether or not it's in our national interest to continue to support Ukraine. Where do you come down on that? So I think we have already given a lot of military aid to Ukraine. I think what we need to do now is ask their European partners if there's going to be continued military funding. They need to take the lead on this. We have been uh, by far the largest funder of data for in its entire existence. We have been taking the lead for decades throughout the Cold War and beyond. I think it's now, again, time for us to take a military step back. But at the same time, we can re-engage the situation on a humanitarian basis. If I were President of the United States, my policy would be simple. Anybody who wants to get out of the war zone of Ukraine, who's in Ukraine right now, should be able to come to the United States as a refugee. We can let them get settled here. If the war ends, they want to go back home, they can do that. If they want to stay here and settle, we should be able to make, you know, make that happen as well. I would also make that same offer to any member of the Russian military who's currently in Ukraine, right now fighting. You can abandon your post. If you can get to, a, if you can get to one of our allies and give yourself up, we will bring you to the United States on asylum. Because I know many of the Russian military are conscripted. They don't want to be fighting this war either. And in fact, we see stories about war protesters and people trying to speak out against the war in Russia being sent to the front lines. And so I think if we can give those people a chance to abandon their post, I think it would also lessen the morale of the entire Russian military. And you would see them scaling themselves, hopefully back across the border and suing for peace. But ultimately, I think our lead needs to be a humanitarian one. We need to get as many people out of the war zone as possible and let the governments fight their war. And if they're going to be funded by anybody other than our plus hundred billion that we've already given, I think we need to examine letting Europe take that lead and kind of, because they're the ones who are most directly threatened by an expanding Russia, right? It would expand into Western Europe if you were to keep moving. They're the ones with the most vested interest. Let them take the lead militarily. And then the interesting thing there is um, if you, once you bring in the humanitarian aid that has been provided to Ukraine, Europe has provided far greater amount of uh, assistance to Ukraine, um, which is just something that uh, we like to, to put out there that, that Europe is, is helping in this, mm -hmm. of course. Um, okay, so that's Russia, that's uh, domestic politics as well, uh, that will We'll avoid that conversation at this point, but we won't talk about it until we have a speaker of the house. Sure. We're not going to talk about it today. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, can you tell us? Let's let's switch our focus to, to China. Um, competition, uh, conflict. What's the the path forward in the U.S.-China relationship in the in an Oliver uh, administration? So again, uh, so where am I? worldview comes from this is I spent six years working in logistics in the maritime and shipping industry. And so I know very well how interconnected China's economy is to the United States via trade. I see it every single day. Uh, and so my ultimate goal is, is you know, I am, a, I am a free trade supporter as much as possible because I see how it has created a, a situation in China where a billion people have been moved out of extreme poverty into a growing middle class in China. 
Those are going to be the next generation of consumers of American goods, provided we continue to take the lead on innovation. We do have to protect our, uh, you know, our copyrights and our, our, you know, when people create something, it shouldn't just be taken away from them via the Chinese government doing these things. There has to be some sort of protection for people's property uh, and for their creations. I understand this. Uh, and I think ultimately, if we do this, we're going to be able to have, be the leaders in innovation in the world that has a billion new consumers ready to buy our goods. Uh, and this is in regards to all kinds of sectors that we need to deregulate our own economy so we can make it so it's easier for people to start a new business in the United States and actually grow and compete with a growing China. Because that's what China's ultimately starting to do. They were a hardcore red communist state and they have begun to liberalize their markets. And as they have, they've seen this growing middle class. They're going to continue liberalizing their markets. We need to be doing the same in terms of deregulating and making it easier for people to start that small business, that they will then compete with the medium business, that will hopefully compete with the large business. We've kind of taken this top-down approach where we've actually funded the large corporate interests, and even when they fail, we bail them out. And the natural reaction should be let them fail, let them break up into a bunch of pieces, let people buy their inventory and then liquidate it and start new businesses. And so we need to return back to more market-based practices as opposed to centrally planned government control of the market. And when we do that, we are going to be able to compete with China in a way we're not right now. And China's doing that right now. They have, they have done that over the last few decades. Uh, and as they continue to kind of liberalize their marketplaces, we need to be leading in innovation. Otherwise, we stand the risk of falling behind. And that's not going to happen in four or eight years. It's, that is a, you know, when I think about things, I don't think about the next financial quarter. I think about quarter century. Uh, and so I want us to continue leading the way through deregulating our markets, through innovation, to be able to compete with China on the world stage. Uh, but ultimately, I think our relationship trading with them is a good thing for both of us. It creates peace and stability, uh, even though there is the saber rattling I mentioned earlier, and it creates the ability for the United States to trade with a billion new customers, and it gives the ability for China to grow out of where it was and uh, continue to bring people out of extreme poverty. I think that's a great thing around the world. Uh, so we have seen, starting with the Trump administration, continuing with the Biden administration, a increase in tariffs and, and economic sanctions against China. Uh, is that something that you support and would continue? Would you roll back or keep the same? I'm absolutely against them. And the reason being is they're actually not tariffs against China. They're tariffs against the American consumer. Because when you're tariffed, it's not like that is paid by China. What it does is it says, it, well, it makes buying Chinese goods less competitive in the American marketplace. Ultimately, you as the consumer will be paying for that tariff. You're paying for the excess cost of either paying for more expensive, say, Chinese steel, for instance, or the added cost of, well, now you're buying American steel. Either way, you're paying more than you were at the beginning. Tariffs are not a tax on China. And this is one of the things that, you know, it's the biggest economic myth of the Trump administration is that if we tariff a country, well, they're paying for it. They're paying for taking American jobs away. All you're doing is making it more expensive for that American businessman, for that American entrepreneur to start their business and continue it. So I'm absolutely against tariffs as a foreign policy. Uh, I think it leads, again, to oh, less, uh, you know, less friendly market relationships around the world. And like I said, people who trade don't shoot at each other. And so I would like to facilitate as much friendly trade as we can in creating trade barriers like tariffs absolutely are against that philosophy. So if I were president, I would remove all of them. Uh, it's kind of what Biden ran on promising to do, that Trump's foreign policy and his economic policy was garbage, but then he continued much of it and actually, as you said, expanded tariffs. So. Uh, an Oliver administration would remove those tariffs, remove those market barriers. And would that uh, expand to the export controls on like semiconductors and uh, that kind of stuff that has been turned, framed in the national security sort of realm? You know, uh, I, I understand that there are national security implications, but ultimately I would like to see as many things uh, free market as possible. So I'd like to remove as many possible barriers, and that includes maybe some things that are a little more controversial. But ultimately, again, if we're trading with each other, I don't fear a military response from China. And so as long as we are continuing to be economic partners and, and, and continue to have good faith, uh, as much as possible, right? You're not getting great faith out of China right now. But if we can start taking that first step and extend the hand, possibly have them extend their hand, ultimately we'll be shaking hands and being partner nations as opposed to being adversarial in the marketplace. And I think the quicker we remove our tariffs and the quicker we remove export uh, barriers, the, the faster that'll happen, but of course China has to do that too. Like they have to be taking the same steps we are. And uh, of course, the the biggest potential flashpoint between China and the U.S. is Taiwan. Um, 
where would an, uh, an Oliver administration stand on the status of Taiwan and, and its potential defense? I recognize this will not probably give me a lot of support from Taiwanese <laughs> Americans, but uh, I was actually in Indianapolis at a campaign stop. We were outside of a hotel just chatting, and an elderly gentleman and his wife came up and they sat down, and someone said, this guy's running for president. He said, well, I have a question for you. And he was in his 80s. He said, you know, 50 years ago or, or so, a lot of good men were sent overseas to contain communism by fighting in Vietnam. They drafted a lot of good men to go fight who didn't want to go fight. The question for you is, would you ever use the draft or send our good men and women militarily to fight in Taiwan to fight for Taiwan? And I said I would not, because I don't believe that we should be using the United States military to fight a war that we don't have a direct threat. There's not a direct security threat in a war in Taiwan. And so I would not seek to use our military to do that. And if we were to, it would have to be through a formally declared war for Congress. I would not just be using AUMFs like we've been using in this country. Uh, I, I do run and remind people, the AUMF that we're fighting the war on terror was passed in 2001. Ask yourself how many members of Congress are either no longer in Congress or actually dead who voted on that. And that's the continuation, that's the authority that we still do this. I think if we took that, you know, we should sunset things like that, but really only formally declare war. So, no, I would not go to war in Taiwan. I believe we have sold them lots of great military equipment. I believe they're an island nation that can defend themselves for quite a bit of time. And ultimately, I think that's quite enough of a buffer against China invading. Again, China doesn't, doesn't want to disrupt their nation too much either. So, for anyone who may not remember AMF authorization for military force. Yes, uh, AUMF uh, authorization for use of military yeah. force. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, this is the the hardest, I think, uh, questions uh, we have seen. Horrible images coming out of Israel and Palestine, Gaza specifically. Um, the US government has uh, come to the aid and support of Israel. Uh, what are your, your thoughts and views, understanding that this is a very fresh and new new conflict that is, you know, 70, 70 years in the making? So yeah, so uh, first, uh, I'm, a, I'm a person of deep religious faith. And so the first thing that I always do is you say a prayer for the innocent people who have passed away. What's happened this last week in Israel, uh, with Hamas breaking through into Israel, invading civilian neighborhoods, uh, and, and shooting people at a music festival, killing entire families, it is a brutal act. There's no getting around that. It's terrible. It's horrible. And we also have to recognize, we have to investigate what caused this, <coughs> why we, why the Israeli government, who claims to have this great intelligence, did not know what was going to happen. Uh, and so there's gonna be domestic implications there for the Netanyahu government, because there are many questions asked by Israelis today as to why this occurred, how this occurred. And now that it has occurred, we have to examine the conditions that allowed this kind of violence to bubble the surface, which is what we're seeing in Gaza. It's a tightly compacted group of people, millions of people, many of whom living in extreme poverty, over half of them being children. When there is desperate situations like what we see for the Palestinians in Gaza, out of that desperation, sometimes horrible, horrible abhorrent violence burst bubbles to the surface. And that's what we saw out of Hamas uh, this past week. We have to objectively examine that motivation, free from the emotional aspects of it, because emotionally, everyone is hurting right now. And then we have to look at the response of the State of Israel. Now, I believe the United States is doing right by moving their aircraft carrier into the region, because what it's doing is it's signifying to the other nations of the world, you're not going to take advantage of this moment to invade Israel. I do believe Israel has a right to exist, right? Uh, and so that is what we should be doing right there. It's basically signaling to Iran, like, if you decide to take advantage of this, it will be a very, very bad day for you. Uh, without sending any troops on the ground. I think we can do that with our Navy. Uh, but we have to examine Israel's response and the blowback that that might still be creating because we have had uh, just in our, I believe, 1,500 Israelis dead from the Hamas attacks, which is horrible. And if you look at, like, the, by the percentage-wise, it's many times worse than our own 9-11, right? Uh, but we also have to examine that now there are, like, thousands and thousands of Palestinians dead, including, I believe, near 1,000 children at this point. Is that response from Israel going to wipe out the, the hatred in the region. I don't think it will. Will it root out Hamas? Possibly, but what's going to come in Hamas's place? What's gonna grow out of this animosity? Because I can tell you right now, if you put yourself in the image of a, a Palestinian who has just been told, your building is about to be blown up in an airstrike because we believe there's some Hamas militants who live here. 
you have 30 minutes. Grab everything you can, get your children out of there, and then watch on as your home is destroyed. Do you think that the children who now just saw all the trauma, that they're, they're, they're gonna all of a sudden be loving the state of Israel, that they're going to grow out of the hatred that's been created in the region? I don't believe it will. This does not justify what Hamas does. This does not justify the violence that goes towards Israel, uh, the, the Israeli citizens. What it does is ask the Israeli government, is there not a better way to be able to fight terrorism? Is there not a more surgical precision that we can do to root out Hamas? And they also have to remember there are hundreds of hostages. What is to stop the people of Hamas from putting those hostages in the buildings that we airstrike? And then whose death is that on? That is, that is, a, that is the complicated nature of what we're dealing with. There is no great solution to this other than to say we have to pray for peace. We have to ask that Israel be as surgical in their response as possible to root out Hamas, which they have a right to do. If people came to the United States and they committed the acts that Hamas did, we would absolutely expect our government to react. Nobody should not, nobody should be saying Israel has no right to react at all to this. That's, that's just false. There's, there's just no justification to say that. What we do have to say is, is how can our friend Israel, our, our ally, sometimes the United States, if we're allies, we have to be willing to tell our allies, you have to do this better. This is not going to fix the problem. What we cannot do as an ally is force these two sides together under some sort of talks. We cannot set those terms. We cannot set the time and the date. All we can do is continue what I believe is the best position, which is to say there needs to be a two-state solution to this. It does not appear that a one-state solution is in the cards uh, because either one of those, whether it be a Palestinian or a Jewish state, uh, Israeli state, will lead to a lot of further confrontation. There has to be some sort of two-state solution. I don't know what that is, frankly, because I am not a Palestinian and I'm not Israeli. And that needs to be the position of the government. We want peace in the region. We want a two-state solution. We are willing to try to facilitate that, but we're not going to force it. And we're not going to uh, be the main player in the game. Frankly, I think if we try to do that, the people of the Palestinian government would look at uh, anything we do as putting a thumb on the finger for Israel because we have already donated so many billions of dollars um, in military aid. So I would seek to ultimately try to find a peaceful solution, as, as crazy as that sounds, but I don't think it's going to come from the United States government. I think the best we can do is pray for the victims. And again, if there are people who want to get out of Gaza, we should be facilitating and we should be actually kind of demanding that Israel leave the border open for people who want to flee. I don't think closing the border, closing the electricity, closing the water, all this stuff, is, is, it's not humane. And so I would ask that they open up the areas to get refugees out and bring those refugees to the United States. And I know that's controversial because many people in Palestine have maybe a negative view of the United States. You know what will give them a positive view of the United States? Rescuing them from the situation they're in today. We will not export positive, uh, positive uh, feelings in the United States with bombs. We do it with Burger King. You do it with capitalism. You do it with bringing people to see what a truly free market looks like. You don't do it with the military. So let these people come out. Let these people get away. Frankly, anybody in Israel who wants to be a refugee for a time, let them, let them come here. Let them settle here for a while until the conflict is over, and then can go back home. Uh, last question for me until we open it up to the audience. Uh, so if you're on, watching online, uh, I've, I've got my phone here. Uh, send us an email or uh, put it in the chat and we'll, we'll get that question asked for you. Um, but in terms of uh, global trends, one of the, the constant conversations is around the um, issue or, or the competition between authoritarian styles of government and democracy. The Biden administration, of course, is been, been promoting democracy, uh, having their, their, a couple of summits on democracy. Uh, is that a competition? Is that a issue that the United States should be involved in? Uh, or should we allow countries their, their own space to make their own decisions with all that entails? Well, I think countries are going to make their own decisions. I, again, I don't think uh, doing anything under the barrel of a gun, trying to force things, or even doing it in a more clandestine way, like if you look at what we did with Iran and how we're still suffering those ramifications for our, and, you know, kind of getting involved in their politics. The United States can't force those things. What we can do is we can be a beacon of anti-authoritarianism. That's what we should be. Libertarians are the antithesis of, anti uh, of authoritarianism. We believe in so long as you're being peaceful, you should be able to make your own choices, whether in the marketplace, the way you live, how you handle your property, whatever, how you worship, uh, how you express yourself, who you love, all those things should be up to an individual so long as they're living in peace. 
And if we can have a government that facilitates that kind of message, and we can put that outward, trust me, you're going to see much more anti-authoritarian movements growing around the world because they're going to see that beacon of light, and they're going to say that is what we want. And they're going to oppose authoritarianism. What we need to be doing to oppose authoritarianism around the world is opposing authoritarianism here in the United States. And so when you have people who demagogue, when you have people who constantly create this binary partisanship, when you have people who want to uh, use the force of government to instill their will upon other people, uh, that's what we need to be opposing. Because when we are authoritarian here at home, uh, internationally, governments will get more authoritarian because you know we are the market leader of the world. We are somebody who's seen as kind of like guiding the kind of the world, uh, the world movements out there. And so we should be embracing anti-authoritarianism, cosmopolitan living in the United States, broad-based ability to live, you know, a, a what it would be called a classically liberal uh, life here in the United States. And I believe the Libertarian Party can be the best facilitator of that. And as we uh, push back against authoritarianism, we'll see that happening more around the world. But again, we can't force those movements, but what we will see is an embracing of more freedom around the world. And I think. Uh, the more we, we see that, uh, the better it's going to be. And so we have to be, we have to be putting our best face forward here at home in order to see that reflected back at us in our international partners. Sure. Um, all right, I'll open it up. We've got a couple of questions online, but uh, anyone in the room have a question they'd like to ask? Yeah, Kevin. I do. Um, and you, you, I asked this question at a previous um, session with Marianne Williams, and it was a two-parter. Uh, one was um, deploying troops without a um, declaration of war. What would an Oliver uh, administration do? Congress handed you an AUMF and said, "This is this is what we expect. Um, you know, please go ahead, use your executive powers, uh, go handle it." And then the, the kind of a follow-up question, related, is there is a, a movement in the U.S. Um, that you may have heard of called Defend the Guard. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually, it's, it's, it's um, being worked on in, in more than half states. And just last week in New Hampshire, uh, it came out of committee with a recommendation to pass. Um, and what Defend the Guard does is says that uh, New Hampshire will not um, to allow its, its National Guardsmen to be deployed overseas mm -hmm. without a declaration of war. And what, I guess the follow-up question is, what's your opinion of? States taking um, that type of stance to kind of disaffiliate with the uh, the national security apparatus. Yeah. Um, with, without that. Yeah. So first part of your question: What would I do if Congress handed me an AUMF uh, and they said, "Well, you can just use your executive authority to carry this out"? Uh, I would reject it. I would veto it. I would say, "You need to bring me a declaration of war," because the truth is, is any kind of war is going to have costs. It's going to have real cost to the country. It's going to have cost to individual families who lose service members and those service members who might come back injured both physically and mentally. And so that should never be on one person. And in representative democracy, that needs to be voted on and done by the representatives, the legislative branch. That is their job. So bring me a declaration of war if we're going to war. Otherwise, unless there is a major emergency where we have to respond instantly, some sort of international incident where we have to you know, maybe deploy the Navy to rescue somebody, you know, so there's a major, we were able to do that because we're already in the region. Other than that, no, declare war. And uh, as far as defend the guard, I always point back to Hurricane Katrina, you know, uh, I had friends who literally housed Katrina refugees in their, on their couch uh, because of how bad the conditions were in New Orleans. How many more people could have been saved off their rooftops had the, new, new, uh, the Louisiana National Guard been able to be activated, except many of them and their helicopters were actually fighting in Iraq at the time. And so uh, when we talk about Defend the Guard, there, is real, there could be a real human impact. There could be a major blizzard in the area of New England that would require the National Guard to help uh, provide services and logistics in an emergency crisis, right? Uh, or there could be an invasion one day and you would want to have the National Guard handy to do that, right? Uh, so I absolutely support Defend the Guard. Actually, I forgot my Defend the Guard lapel button that I was going to be wearing today, uh, but, uh, but I digress. I'm somebody who absolutely supports that legislation because that is the purpose of the National Guard is to defend our nation and they should be administered at the state level. This is why we have 50 uh, different state National Guards and uh, that should be under the purview of the state government. Get, them, get the federal government out of that as much as possible unless they formally declare war happens, in which case it's all hands on deck, we're all into this together. It's a World War II kind of situation. Uh, and you know, I absolutely think the Finley Guard should be supported, not here just in New Hampshire, but in all the states where it's enacted. 
I'm a proud supporter of it in the state of Georgia. And uh, if you do not have Defend the Guard legislation in your state and you're out there watching this right now, I encourage you to start organizing and get that legislation on the books and start demanding that from your legislators in your state because we can decentralize the National Guard and uh, put that back in the purview of our states. And that's right where it belongs. Um, we've got a question online from GHJKL645. Um, should we continue to trade with countries that do not like us? Why should we support their economies to work against us? Yes, we should. Uh, because ultimately you're going to develop better relationships the more you trade. Uh, we went to war with Japan and Germany. And guess what? After the war, we traded with Japan and Germany, and they're now both very strong uh, liberal economies right, and liberal democracies. And so uh, we did the same thing with Vietnam. We fought a vicious war in Vietnam. They're now one of our greatest trading partners. As I said earlier, you don't export friendliness with bombs and bullets. You do it with Burger King and uh, capitalism, right? Uh, I use that example because there's a great film, Goodbye, it's a fictional film, but it's Goodbye Lenin. It's all about the fall of communism and, uh, and the fall of the wall. And you see this East Berlin family all of a sudden embracing how great their life is and how great all the changes are. And they never even realized how much better their partners to the West and West Berlin had it until the wall fell. So in, once we embrace trade with these nations that maybe are adversarial to us, their people will certainly be appreciative of all the goods and, and that they are able to consume and all the trade they're able to make. And the best way we can also help developing economies is not through maybe a foreign aid program through government. I encourage micro lending, uh, taking your own money, investing it into developing economies where it comes back to you interest free as a loan and you can loan it back out again. What you're doing there is you're planting the seeds that will one day be the crop that comes to harvest when they put their product on a container and it comes to your port. And so there are great ways to facilitate uh, friendliness with other nations through market trade. Uh, and it's certainly better than being adversarial to each other. I'd rather shake hands and snarl at one another. I think ultimately you become better friends that way. Uh, Maura is asking to learn a little bit more about your view of multilateral institutions such as the United Nations and the World Bank. Yeah, so um, as much as I like talking with our partners around the world, I find the UN often gets stuck. It is a huge bureaucracy. And if you know anything about libertarians, we kind of we kind of are like, oh, we shake when we see bureaucracy. We don't like it because it often leads to kind of inefficient work. And because of the way our National Security Council is set up, it's like literally nothing gets, nothing of really any super uh, substantive stuff gets passed. Because I, you know, usually what ends up happening is one of those members of the Security Council are the people who are kind of backing up what's going on in an area of the world. Like let's say something's going on in Central Africa. Well, there's a good chance that China has a vested interest in what's going on in there. So any UN action that we might want to take there, well, China's going to veto it. Or maybe there's somewhere where the United States has a very vested interest in what we're doing, and the UN might not like it. Well, we're going to just veto it. And so ultimately, they kind of have their hands tied. I think the best use of the UN is for the ability for governments to come together and actually be able to plainly speak what their, what their goals are and, and what they're seeking. And it's a great place for open dialogue but to like create effective change through the UN, I don't think necessarily happens. What I think happens at the UN is we have people from all around the world being able to meet and create those relationships. Sometimes that facilitates a lot more peace and understanding in the region, but like nothing of major substance of stuff is happening because of that veto power by the Security Council. Uh, the World Bank, I think a lot of times, has uh, created more misery than it's trying to solve. Uh, through their loans, particularly in Africa, it has kind of created a little bit of misery, having these poorest nations in the world having to like pay back these loans that maybe, uh, you know, it, it's not going to grow their economy the way they're being kind of uh, pushed into paying back these loans. So it's, it's there's got to be a better way to do it. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I'm kind of distrustful of the United States putting itself into these international groups where they're kind of having their hands bound. Uh, and so I would seek to well, not be an isolationist. I'm certainly not an isolationist. I believe the best way for us to be partners in the region is through free market, free trade, and let our economies handle this, as opposed to bureaucrats who sit in a fancy building with a fancy title and who spend hours and hours in meetings. Uh, the trillions of marketplace decisions that will happen throughout each and every day will do a better job of facilitating international uh, unity than the hundreds of decisions bureaucrats will make in multilateral meetings all day. So a follow on to that, the U.S. is the largest funder of both those organizations as well as many other based on economic formulas. Uh, 
would you support continuing that, that funding or, or try and pull it back? Well, let's, uh, I'll be realistic. You know, if I were elected president, right, and, uh, and I took office in 2025, that's not gonna be the top of my priority list to defund those things. I have a lot of domestic areas that I think we can reduce government and the size and scope of, uh, but eventually that will be something we have to look at. Like, is this, are we getting our value for it? Like, is the value that we're taking from the American taxpayer's pocket worth what we get out of putting in these institutions? Really everything along the government's gonna to have to be judged that way in a libertarian administration, but along the priority list, I don't find that to be the highest of priorities, considering it's really a drop in the bucket of the federal treasury, uh, and so, there's a lot more uh, taxpayer, uh, incent, you know, taxpayer interest that I need to be looking out for first. But it would certainly be something we would look at as to whether we're getting our value for it. Yeah. That sparks another idea for me. Uh, many people, if you look at surveys, think about 40% of the U.S. Bu budget is dedicated to uh, foreign aid, but of course it's less than 1%. Um, do you have a sense on, you know, is it a similar idea towards foreign aid, uh, that, that it's so small it's not a high priority, uh, or is it something that you would, you would look at, and, and if so, what would you propose doing around it? While it's lower on the spending priority, ultimately I think we have seen over time the model of foreign aid has not been the most successful way to get developing economies and to help these other nations. Because as Ron Paul said a long time ago, you're taking the pockets out of the, you're taking money out of the working man's pocket and the richest nation on earth, and you're giving it to the richest people and the poorest nations on earth. It's just not the best way to facilitate aid because it goes from government to government, and government is very inefficient. They essentially plan and cracks get created that people fall through. As I said earlier, the best way to help these developing economies is through direct economic investment from we the consumer, from we the American taxpayer. As opposed to having our tax money taken out, I would seek, you know, to uh, from the bully pulpit, obviously, this can't be government forced or mandated, but encourage people that if they want to invest in the developing world to do so through micro lending or other financial uh, packages that allow to directly invest and put that capital right into the hands of business owners, as opposed to inefficiently handing it to a government. Uh, you know, uh, uh, what is it, a radio show guy listened to years ago was like, we keep giving them mosquito nets, and what we really need to be doing is developing marketplaces so they can buy their own mosquito nets. Like that needs to be the truth of it. So I would seek to remove ultimately the inefficient foreign aid package that we have, and while it is only 1% of the foreign, uh, or 1% of the trade, or the budget rather, uh, I would encourage that 1% to then be funded by directly from the American taxpayer to go ahead and invest in developing economies and uh, ultimately kind of seek to do that trade yourself as opposed to the inefficiencies of government. Okay. Um, Nagar is wondering about the um, top priority internationally for you. We've covered a lot of issues already, um, but what is the w number one thing you think that the U.S. can and should be involved in? Um, and uh, also wondering, does the U.S. lead in that, or is it a coalition approach? So uh, the U.S. has to take a lead on, uh, on the the dual the dual perp uh, or the, the dual goals of reducing our military footprint while increasing free trade at the same time. That that can't be like you can't have that being separated. While we remove our military footprint, we have to be reducing trade barriers because it, that, it, when we do that in conjunction with one another, we are sending a signal to our international partners around the world that no longer will you have to be a partner in the United States on a, hey, if you're not our partner, something bad could happen in your region, and more into, we want to be trading partners with you. We want to see how we can develop our marketplace economies so that we can pull people out of extreme poverty. And I am a, I am a big time capitalist, so maybe this won't work in some more of the socialist economies out there, but I want to be a trader with you because ultimately, uh, capitalism has pulled more people out of extreme poverty in the last 100 years than any economic system that's ever existed. And so I would seek to try to export that around the world to our trading partners. Um, but you know, the biggest goal is to restore the good faith of the American people with many of our, mili uh, with many of our international uh, partners and neighbors out there because right now, because of our reckless militarism over the last 20 years and our insistence on building trade barriers, certainly over the last two presidential administrations, uh, as we've seen like kind of hyper-focused into that, uh, we have not developed great morale with our uh, friends around the world. They all have a great opinion of us. So I think the best way to create that better opinion in the United States is to take our hands off of the guns and put our hands towards shaking others in, in, in marketplace relationships. So there's a, there's a debate that has been going on really since the, the past two uh, administrations about free trade, fair trade, uh, bilateral versus large, uh, large
large trading blocks. Uh, we saw the negotiation of TPP that then ultimately fell through. We've seen a renegotiation of NAFTA into the USMC, MCA. Uh, where do you come down on free trade, fair trade, trade agreements? Uh, are you looking to, I mean, obviously you're looking to expand trade, uh, but how do you? So I'm a, I'm a, free, I am, I am a free trade guy. Uh, and ultimately, I think uh, true free trade, being as uh, reducing as many marketplace barriers as possible to trade, will actually develop better conditions in some of these places that have lower labor conditions and other standards right there. And I do think that uh, it, this also has to involve itself with true market transparency. The consumer has to know what their dollar is buying when they purchase a good. And I think with the expansion of information, you know, the information age, the fact that we can so easily access that information as compared to say 50 years ago, uh, free trade becomes more attractive than saying, well, we gotta put up trade barriers because X nation does this or that or whatever. Um, I think the American consumer can now figure out where their dollar is coming from and decide whether they want to invest in that or not. And some people will say, you know what, it's worth paying more to get my you know, coffee from somewhere that it treats their workers correctly. And in fact, you're gonna see uh, companies that advertise, you know, we have great labor policies for where we get our stuff from. Like, we, we only import are these goods from places that practice these human rights standards. And you can have private organizations that can determine those standards and that can create those, and you can pop that on your label, you know. This is a, this is a uh, you know, fair labor practiced good. And it might cost a little bit more, but the American consumer is willing to pay for that. And so, ultimately, I am a free trade guy. I don't think the, the government creating barriers is what's gonna break down, let's say, unfair labor practices in other nations. Uh, you know, I don't think anything we can do is ultimately gonna be the facilitates that unless we wanna, again, get involved in other nations' affairs, which often leads to bad outcomes. So, yeah. Uh, so would you, trade. would you then unilaterally remove trade barriers into the U.S. without yeah. reciprocal uh, action from other countries? No, I would seek to do that on a one-on-one on one basis. I would reach out to each and every leader of each nation and say, how can we break down these trade barriers? Where are trade barriers existing for us? Where do they exist for you? Where can we break them down to be as free trade as possible? And you know, the idea would be ultimately get us to a true marketplace economy where the entire world is practicing free market practices. Uh, that's the ideal. We might not get to that ideal, but what we can do is through hard work and through real diplomacy, sit down with each of our international neighbors out there in the world and do this. And I don't think it should be done through like giant trade agreements with multinations. That needs to be done one-on-one -on, -one on a basis because uh, you know, when you do, when you, when you, the more players you get involved in one thing, the more priorities kind of shift, and then they start fighting amongst themselves about what the priority needs to be for the trade package. Let's just do this one on one, uh, and I think that's the best way to get the best outcomes with most people. And you start with the people who are our natural allies, and then you work towards those people who maybe don't like us as much. Okay, uh, Leah is asking uh, via the email. Um, you mentioned refugees. There are 125,000, it looks like, uh, or, or that's the cap. Um, is that enough? Should that be expanded? Should that be reduced? Where do you come down on welcoming refugees to this country? I'm on expanding it. We have a huge nation. We have plenty of room. This idea that we don't have room for refugees is crazy. Uh, let them come here. They're going to come here. They're going to put down roots during the time of the conflict. And again, if they want to stay afterwards, I encourage allowing the ability to let them stay here and eventually become citizens. Like I embrace the diversity that America offers. I've traveled all over the country running for president. I've met people from all over the world who've come to this country, who put down their roots, and who love this country. And I want to embrace that spirit of immigration. It's what brought my forefathers here. Nearly every person here uh, ancestrally came from somewhere else. And so I would seek to continue that policy. Remove these barriers. It's these same barriers, by the way, that in World War II prevented us from having Jewish refugees coming and rescued them from the Holocaust. So why would we still be putting up barriers from people who are seeking to flee terrible conditions where there could be death and despair? Let, remove those barriers. Let them come here. Embrace America. Again, even if they go back home afterwards, they're going to go back home saying, we were saved by America. They let us come here and stay here, and now we have goodwill for them. That's the best way to create goodwill around the world for people who are suffering, is to let them come here as refugees and settle here and either stay here and create a vibrant uh, XYZ American community, you know, Iranian American, Palestinian American, Israeli American, Russian American, whatever. Let them come here and start their own vibrant communities and uh, embrace it. And frankly, as somebody who loves this country and loves traveling around it, I embrace that diversity uh, because frankly, 
chain restaurants, the same thing, the same day, every day is boring. I like to see the diversity of our neighborhoods, the diversity of our opinions, the diversity of the way we worship, or even the food, like I said, even the food we eat. There are advantages to having a uh, multicultural world in the United States. And uh, I believe removing refugee caps will help facilitate that and create goodwill in the long run. Uh, so, uh, let's see, just going through our, our options here. Um, Lauren is asking about um, climate change mm -hmm. and uh, what measures will you take to ensure that the United States remains a leader in advancing global efforts to combat climate change? Awesome. So the best way that we can do that is actually by removing the barriers to innovators in this country. Uh, we have a lot of regulations, particularly around the nuclear industry, that if we really want to combat climate change domestically, we're going to have to take the lead on deregulating nuclear and getting more plants online. Uh, particularly, plants are much smaller, much safer, and can produce much more power than they used to. People still have this idea of like Chernobyl and Three Mile Island, but the, the truth is, is like how many technologies currently exist that are the exact same as they were 60 years ago? And so we're thinking with a 60-year-old mindset. Imagine if we did that with a telephone, right? Uh, well, we can't expand telephone technology. There's just too many darn cords everywhere. Uh, and so I think we need to really be embracing nuclear technology as a means to like uh, have a carbon-free future. Um, but ultimately, the way we're going to take the lead is by being those innovators of those new technologies and exporting them around the world while nations like China and India are developing their economies. They are putting a lot of carbon into the air, but they've also pulled billions of people out of poverty. And frankly, if you can exchange like, the worth of pulling people out of poverty for the amount of carbon they're putting in the air, I think it's worth it now. Ultimately, because we're going to develop technologies in the future that will be able to pull that carbon back out of the air. Uh, and so, as those new technologies develop, as these economies are pushing themselves through development, we in the United States need to be taking the lead on uh, unleashing the ability for us to innovate new technologies that are cleaner and ability to be exported around the world. Uh, we can do that with nuclear technology, we can take the lead further in solar and wind if we want to by removing uh, barriers to production there, and ultimately we need to remove subsidizing all fuels because the largest ones that we do subsidize in our country are carbon-based fuels. We need to let the market force us out of that. And again, the consumer wants cleaner fuels. They want cleaner cars. They want cleaner everything. Uh, and so while Elon Musk was happy taking billions of dollars in subsidies to help Tesla along, I do believe he would have still been interested in developing an electric vehicle because he knew that's where the consumers were wanting it. He just took the money that was available on the table. Remove those subsidies, particularly for those carbon producers. Okay. Uh... Leon has quite the reaction to your, your refugee comments. Uh, he says absolutely no more refugees in this country until we secure the border and build the border wall. Uh, what is your response to that comment? So my response to that is, is even the refugee, or even the immigrants who are here, who I imagine he has a concern about, 99% of them, figuratively, I don't know the exact figure, just want to come here and work and live and put down roots. We've always been a nation of immigrants. In fact, I say uh, no to walls. Tear down walls, build bridges. Let more people come through here in an Ellis Island style immigration system. You come through, you declare that you're not sick and that you're not wanted for a crime that requires extradition and that you're not needing to seek asylum. If none of those things are applying, you should be able to come right through here, start a business, settle down, and we should simplify the process to becoming a citizen. I do not fear people who don't look like me and who don't live like me living in the United States. In fact, I embrace it. I think it's what makes us great as a nation, is that we are that diverse melting pot. Uh, and I hate to go back to food all the time, because I am a huge foodie, but I used to live in Atlanta, I used to live right off of Buford Highway, which we call International Boulevard. You can drive down that road and you can see businesses of all different nations, like 30 or 40 different nations just represented along that strip of road. I want to see that all over the country. Uh, I don't fear that. Uh, in fact, I think it's going to make us a stronger nation, and we take the best from around the world, we import them, and that is why we are the strongest economy. That's why we have the best workers. That's why we have the best culture out there that then gets exported out, right? Uh, and so uh, I don't fear. I know this person has that fear, but I want to assuage their fear that if we just let the 99% of people who come through here to work do that, we could put our law enforcement, our border security eyeballs on the actual human exploitation that happens in this country via human trafficking. That is a real concern, and it does really happen, but the vast majority of what our border security is placing their uh, importance on right now is peaceful people who just want to come here and work and who travel thousands of miles, many times without even shoes on their feet or the ability to speak the language, for the opportunity, the opportunity that the, uh, the free nation of the United States provides to them. And again, 
I think that exports our values around the world. So uh, I, I understand that there may be a fear there, but if we really take our eye off of the emotion of it and look at the statistics of how immigrants create more businesses as a country than Native Ameri or the Native born Americans, not Native Americans, Native born Americans rather, uh, and that uh, we uh, in the United States we see you know more businesses and lower crime rates from immigrant populations. And lastly, we do have to get these immigrants out of the shadows. Because right now we have a country where millions of people are living in the darkness. They're living in the ability where they can't seek help when there's a crime in their neighborhood because they fear deportation. Where children who might be being abused can't go to an authority figure and, and tell them what's going on for fear that they or their parents might be deported. Where we have people who might be suffering domestic abuse, for instance, and they can't go seek a help in a shelter for them and their children because they might be found to be an immigrant and get sent home. That's the real human cost of keeping people in the shadows, and the best way for us to stop those worst outcomes is to open our immigration system and not be fearful of those who might look different than us or speak a different language or worship differently or uh, have a different culture. I don't fear them, I embrace them. Okay, I think we have time for two more questions and then I'll give you an opportunity for a closing statement. Mm -hmm. um, Jane is asking, uh, what do you see as the United States' number one national security threat and how would you approach resolving that? So uh, our number one national security threat, uh, like so I don't fear like invasion, foreign invasion from another nation because our military is just so gigantic and we would overpower anybody that would try to invade us. So our greatest uh, national security threat is gonna be uh, domestic violence here in the United States, whether it come from somebody who is an extremist, be a religious extremist or supremacist extremist or whatever have you. This is where the mass violence is coming from. It's, the call is coming from inside the house. And so no, I don't fear foreign power invading us, but I certainly do think that we need to examine the violence that exists in the United States, what's causing that, and how we can curb that violence. Uh, and that is a, you know, while maybe not national security threat, it's the biggest threat uh, inside of the nation would be that kind of violence, that kind of mass violence. Um, and uh, I, I also say uh, the biggest threat to our national security and to our liberal democracy is the continued uh, political binary, this continued two-party system that continues giving us the lesser of two evil candidates, which eventually just get down to evil. And so I would like to see more competition in our political marketplace, because that way we can hold our leaders accountable, uh, and we can hold them to, you know, and we can get rid of them when they do terrible things, and when they try to uh, unilaterally control power, seize power, or ask their followers to do the same thing, uh, and particularly when they lose an election. And so I think we need to have that more competition in the marketplace. Uh, because that's how you hold politicians honest, is with your vote and with your voice, and we need to break down barriers to having more choices and more voices. Great. Uh, so John is asking, what would your approach be to address global health concerns like uh, the COVID-19 pan pandemic or the next future pandemic? Yeah, so uh, there's a, if I were to sit here and just name the list of mistakes the government made during the pandemic, we'd have to have be here for at least another hour. But what I can say is, is there were immediate mistakes at the very beginning of this pandemic and then on throughout. The first immediate mistake was our FDA dragging its feet on the ability for us to get testing out there because that is what made it uh, so able for COVID to spread so quickly in the United States, even more quickly than say in South Korea, Sweden, and other nations that had more robust testing. Uh, and so that was like the first initial screw up that we had. The screw up that we had throughout this is thinking that we could close down businesses and lock down everything and that was gonna somehow stop the spread of this. Uh, what it did is it actually created a huge economic impact that we really didn't need at the time that we were also suffering from this huge public health crisis. Uh, and so we were, con we were extremely heavy handed, we were extremely unilateral in our ability to do this stuff. And the real victims uh, are not just the people who got sick and died from COVID-19, but it's also the people who lost their businesses, their livelihoods because of the lockdown, because of this stuff. And also the real human cost of like how heavy handed we were with like say, uh, how many people passed away not being able to you know, see their loved ones and be in the room with them when that happened. Like, there's a real human cost to that. And I know many people who uh, lost loved ones during the initial stage of the pandemic and they were saying goodbye through plate glass and they weren't able to really embrace their loved ones during those really critical moments, those last moments of life, whether it was through COVID illness or just you know, uh, you know, someone being uh, sick from something else, right? And so I think our response was completely heavy handed and it wasn't working. And if you look at actually the nation that did the best from our, uh, from both the North American, Western Europe, which are like the economies you can most closely examine, uh, Sweden did the best uh, in terms of not locking down, in terms of not having a heavy hand. And if you see that their, their transmission rates were not any higher and their death rates were back lower, uh, and it's because they embraced the ability of like, hey, you can still be near each other, just be outside, you know, 
take, take, wash your hands, like, you know, basic precautions. And so I think our response to the pandemic was actually created far worse outcomes uh, than if we had absolutely done nothing. Like, uh, because ultimately, here's the thing. If there is a disease out there that is killing people, people will self-lock down. They will self-isolate themselves. And in fact, we were seeing this even before the formal lockdowns happened. Like, people were staying home from work, or they were teleworking. Uh, I believe that people are smart enough to make those decisions and, and to be able to judge for themselves what is best in the best interest for them and for their families and not heavy-handed lockdowns and mandates in this, uh, and, and just from a philosophical point of view. Um, what should we be doing to take the lead uh, internationally with these responses? Uh, first off, be open and free with our information. Don't lock down information. Uh, I think when you, even if it is the correct information, if you lock down any other information from getting out there, so-called disinformation, uh, what you do is you create a natural distrust. People are like, why aren't they letting other people talk? Like, what are they hiding? And we can even see this as far as like, at first, we were advised, don't take the masks. Only let the people who are in the hospitals have the masks. We're gonna have a shortage. And then they said, well, now everybody needs to wear the mask. And then they said, well, this mask works and this one doesn't. And constantly evolved. But anybody who ever questioned from the very beginning, like, does this need to be happening? They were quelled. And because of that, you had a natural backlash. Uh, however fair or unfair that might be towards the public health voices out there. So uh, what would I do? I would leave the information open and transparent, let consum consumers make their own decision, not lock down the country because that created more victims than uh, just the disease itself, and seek to uh, be a little bit more empathic when it comes to how we treat our loved ones who might be passing away and uh, you know allow for us to have that human connection. Great. Well, thank you so much uh, for, for your time. Thank you to the people who have engaged with this, whether in person, online, or, or watching the recording. We really appreciate you taking an interest in these conversations and hope that you uh, feel you are a little bit better informed about uh, Mr. Oliver's uh, views of the world and, and what an Oliver administration would look like. But as I promised, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to close this out with a final statement. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me out here. I really appreciate the opportunity. I think. Uh, you know, having libertarians uh, doing the same things as Democratic and Republican Republican candidates is what we need to actually uh, open up our, our body politic. But if you want to learn more about me and what we're doing uh, with this campaign, go to votechaseoliver.com, or you can actually pull your phone out right now and just text Chase to 21,000 if you want to join the campaign as a supporter, be a, be a volunteer or donor supporter. But at my website, you can see all kinds of press releases, issue papers, uh, you know, media. You can get very well informed about what this campaign is doing and where we're going. Uh, I want to be a generational voice that is different than what we're seeing out of the Republicans and Democrats. Uh, for the last 22 years, we have been fighting, my generation's been fighting the war on terror. Uh, it's my generation that's the generation that had our entire real estate market fall out from underneath us right as we were getting started in the economy. And it's my generation right now that's raising families all over the United States with runaway inflation and the cost of living going through the roof. And so I want to be somebody that fights for uh, a new voice and seeks to be something that's different than the entire 20th century politicians and the entire 20th century politics we've been seeing out of the Republican and Democratic Party. If you want to see something different, I encourage you to get started in this campaign. I encourage you to join the Libertarian Party in your state so you can participate in our convention and help elect me as our Libertarian nominee so we can challenge the two-party system on your ballot in all 50 states. And uh, again, thank you very much for having me. This has been a wonderful opportunity. And uh, if you know where, if you see me coming in your area of the neighborhood, don't be afraid to say hello, shake my hand, and ask me a question. I'm happy to answer it. Well, thank you so much, and uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you, sir.